President, I have some news for you regarding the steel situation. Well, let's hear it. The steel industry is paramount to our success in Korea. Yes. Well, this is from the Steel Workers of America to the Steel Companies of America. It reads, you are hereby notified that since a mutually satisfactory agreement has not been reached, a strike has been called, effective 12.01 a.m. Monday, April 9, 1952. And here, it's signed by every steel worker in every major city and production plant in the country. Monday? Monday, do those hardheads not understand what kind of predicament this puts us in? Especially you, Mr. President? The Koreans aren't going to wait around for us. We're in the middle of a war. Mr. President, those in the steel industry have said that they will not raise wages to what the wage board recommends unless they can increase the price of steel by $12 a ton to compensate. They keep going back to what you said. I said that if a price increase is required in the interest of national defense, it would be granted. It will most certainly not be granted for $12. How they got to that figure is beyond me. Well, they claim they need those $12 to help pay their workers and to compensate for the fact that other industries will have to pay their workers more as this hype spreads. Those poor steel companies, their profits have decreased over $100 million from last year, and they already pay their workers less than just about anyone else. But those companies get paid 10 cents less than auto workers, and they're almost a quarter behind coal miners who get paid almost 2.25 an hour now. They just don't come close to the requirements to grant them a price increase. I'm not signing off on a $12 hike. If worse comes to worse, we'll do half that. Well, you could invoke the Taft-Hartley Act. That would delay the strike for 80 days. No, no, you mean that piece of legislation that we campaigned against, tried to repeal, and that you, Mr. President, called unjust and oppressive? Add to that the fact that the Steelworkers Union has already delayed their strike by 90 days at our request. No, you know what I think? I think we're in a war, you're the president, why don't you just steal the steel? Steal the steel? You're, you're kidding, right? No, no, you can seize the steel mills. You're the president, you've got plenty of executive powers, I'm sure it's in the Constitution somewhere. Let me the Attorney General. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. McGrath quit yesterday. And his replacement? Well, the Senate is taking its time with Mr. McGranary. Uh, what about the Solicitor General? Don't think he's gone home yet. Mr. Perlman? Mr. President, lady, how can I be of assistance? Yes, what are your thoughts on the constitutionality of seizing the steel mills while the two sides squabble? Well, the law says that you can seize an industry if it fails to make delivery on orders from the government. That doesn't really apply here. And I doubt you'll find any law that expressly allows you to do so, but you could try tapping into some of your inherent power. It's definitely done before, over and over in fact. Wilson's done it, Harding's done it, Franklin Roosevelt, even you've done so twice, Mr. President. Well, that's true, but that's only because either Congress has moved to approve your actions, or you've had a leg to stand on constitutionally beside those inherent powers. Nothing like this has ever reached the courts on the highest level before, and this could have ramifications beyond that of the steelwork this year in the 1950s. But just so you know, there's a team of lawyers ready to pounce on either side if you choose to invoke the Taft-Hartley Act or seize the mills. So it's a legal battle either way if you choose not to let them raise prices. I've decided. We'll seize the mills. This is just far too important. All of our recommendations in the past have been more than fair. And all other industries in the past have taken no for an answer and they have continued their production. But the steel companies, they want something that no one else can get and I won't have it. Inform the Secretary of Commerce. I'll be making a public announcement in the coming days. Mr. Randall, I'm Olivia Kingan from the New York Herald Tribune. After meeting with top executives from major steel companies today, what is the position the steel industry will be taking against the worker strike coming tomorrow? Well, obviously we'd love to have our employees come to work on Monday with a wage increase and with a price increase that would allow us to make such an investment in our employees. But at the present time, that's just not possible. The Office of Price Stabilization proposed an increase in price and wages that we found completely one-sided, and we rejected it. Were there any conversations today about the government stepping in to accelerate the bargaining process and potentially stop the strike? Look, everyone knows the president is in the pocket of the labor unions. The right thing for him to do is to call upon the Taft-Hartley Act, postpone the strike for another 80 days, and allow for more negotiations to continue. And 
I think things might just be dire enough for him to come to his senses. I mean, it's not going to make his friends in the labor unions happy, but it sure seems a lot better than any of his other options right now. Were there any conversations today about the President Truman stepping in to seize your facilities? Um, there's been some uh, noise coming from the steel workers union about that. Is there any truth to that? We've heard the same reports, and at the present time, we'd have to say that possibility is very, very unlikely. He doesn't even know if it's constitutional or what the consequences could be. We're prepared, of course, should the president be so arrogant in overstepping his bounds and seize our mills. Hopefully, he either supports the price increase that we proposed or he enacts a tap partly. Either way, we're in for one of the biggest strikes this country's ever seen or one of the biggest lawsuits. John, John, you won't believe it. What's wrong? It's the president. He's addressing the country. And now for a special message from our president. My fellow Americans, tonight our country faces a grave danger. We are faced by the possibility that at midnight tonight, the steel industry will be shut down. That must not happen. We do not have a stockpile of the kinds of steel that we need for defense. If steel production stops, we will have to stop making shells and bombs that are going directly to our soldiers at the front in Korea. We would have to cut down and delay our nuclear energy program. And it won't be long before we have to stop making engines for airplanes. See, the president knows how important we are. He's practically making the case for us. Maybe he grants us a price increase. After all, he said, the price increase is requested, the price increase will be granted. You're right. He did say that, but I still wouldn't be so sure. Listen. I would not be faithful in my responsibility as this president if I did not use every effort to keep this from happening. Therefore, I am directing the Secretary of Commerce to take possession of the steel mills and to keep them operating. Normal collective bargaining is not possible in the current national emergency and the steel industries have demanded a price increase far beyond what was determined by fair, impartial government boards and agencies. He's got to be kidding. Doesn't he know that when the price of steel goes up, the price of things we buy goes up the same way? His taxes already take up two-thirds of our net revenue. Now he wants to increase expenses across the board. That's not good business, war or not. The plain fact is, though most people don't realize it, the steel industry has never been so profitable as it is today. Not since the profiteering days of World War I, at least. Other industries such as paper, brass, trucking, and auto parts had sought rises and had been turned down. They took no for an answer and kept right on producing, but not the steel companies. The steel industries want something special, something that nobody else can get. You may think the steel dispute doesn't affect you. You may think that it's just a matter between the government and the few greedy companies, but it isn't. If we granted the outrageous prices that the steel industry wants, we would scuttle our whole price control programs, and that comes pretty close to everybody in the country. He's villainizing us. Villainizing us to cover up the fact that he just took the private property of over one million people. There's not a word in our constitution or in our laws that says he can do this. I want that injunction tonight! I have lawyers standing by in DC. They can be at the door of the federal district courthouse within an hour. I can also arrange a response broadcast tomorrow. Well, hurry up. We don't have a lot of time. They seize our mills at midnight. Thank you and good night. Here's a quote for you. Our Constitution was founded by our forefathers to prevent tyranny, not to create it. Now I said good night. So, Mr. Bramley, as I understand it, Mr. Keenville of the United States Steel Company will make the general arguments for the steel industry here and now so that we don't have the same arguments in my courtroom all day long. That's correct, Your Honor. He'll make the initial presentation, and I, on behalf of the Bethlehem Steel Company, We'll speak on matters he hasn't discussed to avoid repetition. Go ahead, Mr. Keenville. Thank you. Your Honor, I am here today seeking an injunction against what we consider to be the imminent threat and changes in the terms and conditions of employment of a steel employee. The Secretary of Commerce's intention to raise wages would seriously damage the well-being of the industry when the President has full access to the tax partly Act. And the constitutionality of the seizure is questionable at best. Your Honor, I am here today seeking an injunction which granting the Secretary of Commerce from changing the terms and conditions of employment. So, you're not here for an injunction against the seizure of your steel mills, of which you called unconstitutional, but this is about terms and conditions of employment? Exactly. All we want is a temporary injunction for granting the Secretary of Commerce from changing these terms and conditions of employment. And that's the view of the other companies? Of course. 
Your papers ask for everything, Mr. Kingle. Your Honor, what we want is to have the status quo continue until we have a full trial in the matter. And the sooner that can be had and the case decided, the happier we'll all be. And that's not all that Bethlehem Steel is asking for, Your Honor. We filed a preliminary injunction, and our position is the whole hog. Terms and conditions don't mean anything when the seizure itself is illegal. And that's what we're arguing. I mean, who reads the terms and conditions anyways? Your position is noted, Mr. Bromley. Now, we've all had a long day here, but before we go, Mr. Assistant Attorney General, can you please clarify this one point for me so that I may sleep on it? As to your power, or your client's power, as I understand it in your papers, you do not assert any statutory power. That is correct. And you do not claim any express constitutional power. Your Honor, we base the President's power on Sections 1, 2, or 3 of Article 2 of the Constitution in whatever inherent, implied, or residual powers flow therefrom. When an emergency situation arises that threatens the very well-being of our country, something has to be done immediately. And if there isn't a statutory provision for handling that matter, it is the duty of the executive to step in and protect national security and national interests. So, the executive has unlimited power in a time of emergency. He has the power to do what is necessary to address the emergency. And yet, if the emergency is great, the power is unlimited, yes? Well, I suppose that's true if you carry it to its logical conclusion, but even unlimited executive power has two checks on that, impeachment and a ballot box. But the executive gets to decide what an emergency is, and the courts don't get to review this decision? Yes, and yes. Do you have any examples of where this was allowed? I mean, seizures without statutory authorization. We do, and we provided a couple of examples to you in our papers. I mean, any instances that the court approved of. Oh. No. Not that I know of. Well, sir, I don't think any of those instances would be relevant here, do you? The fact that a man reaches into your pocket and steals your wallet isn't a precedent for making it a valid act. However, this is enough for today. We'll reconvene in the morning with my decision. The fundamental issue is whether the seizure of the steel mills is or is not authorized by law. In my opinion, this issue needs to be decided first, and that is what I shall now do. There is no express grant power in the Constitution authorizing the President to direct this seizure. There is no grant power that from which it can reasonably be implied. There is no enactment of Congress authorizing it. The defendant relies solely on the President's inherent powers under the Constitution. Those inherent powers are not to be confused with his implied powers that are reasonably appropriate to exercise a granted power. I am unwilling to indulge in the assumption that this case is simply a decision between choosing to deal harm to a multi-billion dollar industry or a defense effort just to move forward. I believe the procedures under the Constitution can stand the strains of emergency today as they have in the past. And furthermore, I believe that the contemplated strike, if it were to come with all its awful consequences, would be less harmful to the public than the judicial recognition of an unrestrained executive power. Such recognition would undermine the public confidence in the very edifice of government as it is understood in our Constitution. Therefore, I issue an injunction against the defendant to put an end to the seizure and control of the steel mills of America. Mr. Davis, representing Youngstown Steel, you may begin. Mr. Chief Justice, may it please the court to hear today 
the reasons why the United States government has overstepped the bounds of its power by seizing the steel industries of this nation. A little over a month ago, the steel workers in this nation announced their intention to go on strike, signing what they deem an unsatisfactory agreement regarding their pay and benefits. In response, the executive branch of our government overstepped the limits of its power and seized the steel industries of this nation. In the past, such action has only been taken when the power to do so came from the legislature. However, in this case, the executive branch has granted itself unprecedented and unconstitutional power. The president could have used means legally available to him, such as the Taft-Hartley Act, but he chose not to. Had the president used these means legally available to him, the public safety would not have been immediately jeopardized and the war effort would not have fallen apart. Our leaders are our servants and they are bound by the Constitution of the United States. In this case, the President has overstepped the Constitution and violated the rule of law. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Mr. Perlman, what you just heard was an eloquent argument, but it was an eloquent argument that lacked the facts of this case. After the President seized the mills, he sent a note to Congress in which he pledged to relinquish control of the mills should Congress pass legislation demanding he do so. Over a month passed, and Congress did nothing. But if the President has the power to seize the steel mills, then no act of Congress can stop him. Correct. Although the President agreed to abide by Congress's decision, nothing more than his word is binding him to their decision. You're implying by not acting that Congress has agreed to the President's decision to seize the mills. Their lack of action could be interpreted that way, yes. I think it should be noted that several decisions made by this court have declared that congressional inaction is not to be inferred as congressional approval of executive acts. I would also like to discuss where presidential power is derived from. Much of the executive power comes from Article II of the Constitution along with a number of statutes. And furthermore, the president has always used this power during times of crisis to seize property considered vital to national defense. Can you really use the North American Aviation Plant as precedent for what President Truman has done? Unlike the steel mills, the North American Aviation Plant was under contract with the U.S. government, and the company owners complied with the seizure. In this case, neither of those statements are true. Therefore, the North American Aviation case is not really precedent for this case. Why don't you discuss the Taft-Hartley Act? Well, the Taft-Hartley Act does not allow the President to settle a labor dispute. It merely provides extra time for the parties to work towards a resolution. Maybe because Congress does not want the property to be seized. In this case, the President was attempting to avoid a strike. This was no ordinary act on behalf of the President. He made the decision to act because of the extraordinary circumstances surrounding our country as a nation at war. The seizure of the mills was the only way for the president to provide the steel production vital for the country's war efforts. The situation in Korea may appear to be a war, but Congress has specifically said that it is not. The president acted in response to aggravated war conditions in Korea. You previously emphasized that the president was not exercising war power, but now you are telling us that we are in a war? Well, Mr. Perlman, your time is up. Mr. Davis. In closing, I would like to agree with the Solicitor General that this is no ordinary case. This is a quite extraordinary case. This is a case in which the President of the United States has seized private property from the very people he is bound to serve. It is the duty of this court and all courts to check the President when he oversteps his bounds. The steel seizure was nothing less than an unconstitutional overreach by the President of the United States. This court has been asked to determine the constitutionality of President Truman's seizure of the nation's steel mills. In order to arrive at the answer to this question, a few items must be considered. Firstly, the Constitution of the United States explicitly gives the power to make laws to Congress. The President, as head of the executive branch, derives his powers from either the Constitution or from an act of Congress. In this case, the government has claimed that President Truman's power to seize the steel mills did derive from both the Constitution and from statutes that were enacted by Congress. 
However, nowhere does the Constitution grant the President the power he used to seize the steel mills. Furthermore, no statutes enacted by Congress apply to this particular case. Secondly, the President does not himself have the power to create laws. Therefore, he cannot simply grant himself the power to seize the steel mill. Therefore, seeing that in this case, the President did not derive his power from the Constitution or from an act of Congress, this Court agrees with the District Court that the seizure of the nation's steel mills cannot be allowed, and we deem this act by the President to be unconstitutional. I concur with the opinion of this court. There are, in my view, three distinct categories of presidential power. The first occurs when the president acts in accordance with the will of the Congress. Here he is at the height of his power, as he holds both the power given by Congress, as well as the power he holds in his own right. The second category occurs when he takes action that Congress has neither explicitly granted nor denied him. Here he must rely on the power vested in him by the Constitution. The last category occurs when he uses power that the Congress has explicitly or implicitly denied him. Here the President is at his weakest. This case, the case of the seizure of the nation's steel mills, does not quite fit into the first or second categories. President Truman has used power that most certainly fits within the third category. He has used power that Congress specifically did not give him. In fact, during the debate surrounding the Taft-Hartley Act, a provision was voted down that would have given the President the power to seize property in times of national emergency. Therefore, I concur with the majority opinion of the Court that the President acted outside of his constitutional authority in this case. I agree with the decision of the court that this seizure was unconstitutional. Congress has set out remedies to deal with an issue like the labor crisis currently present in the steel industry. In this case, the president did use one, the Defense Production Act of 1950, but he neglected to use the other. Instead, he set out to chart a new path of power for himself, a path that is altogether unconstitutional. Therefore, I concur with the majority opinion of this court that this seizure is unconstitutional. Due to the extraordinary implications of this case, I, along with two of my colleagues, are compelled to dissent from the majority opinion of this court. It is true that the president used extraordinary powers in this case, but we are living in an extraordinary time. We are facing a conflict that could be more devastating than the Second World War. Also, the President is obligated to carry out the laws of this nation, and that is all he was doing in this seizure. Congress has passed laws requesting that the President expand our national defense effort, and they have also passed laws giving him the power to do so. Precedent also exists in this case that clearly shows that President Truman's actions are constitutional. Among the relevant cases that show precedent is the case of President Roosevelt seizing the North American aviation plant to protect our national defense. President Truman was not acting as a dictator in this case. He was acting as a president who was faithfully carrying out his duties to execute the laws of the United States. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Olivia Kingman from the New York Herald Tribune. Earlier today, the Supreme Court ruled against President Truman's decision to seize the nation's steel mills in what has proven to be a dramatic conclusion to Youngstown versus Sawyer. A 6-3 decision ruled that President Truman's actions were unconstitutional, primarily stemming from the fact that no statute by Congress, and furthermore, no express power in the Constitution, grants the president the ability to simply seize private property. Justices Black and Jackson both wrote on the basis of there being no express powers or statutes for the president to use, with Justice Clark detailing how the president ignored remedies Congress had already set up to avoid a labor crisis. Justice Douglas concurred, writing, and I quote, that when the United States takes over an industrial plant to settle a labor controversy, it is condemning property. 
Though the seizure is only for a week or a month, the condemnation is complete. Chief Justice Vinson, along with Justices Minton and Reed, dissented, stating, and I quote, that those who suggest that this is a case involving extraordinary powers should be mindful that this is an extraordinary time. They have argued that the world has not yet fully recovered from a devastating world war and that we are facing another, more terrifying global conflict. This case has sent shockwaves throughout the nation. As both the public and the president expected the justices, who were all appointed by either President Roosevelt or President Truman, to rule on the side of government. It seems, however, that after nearly two decades of rapidly expanding presidential power, a new era of diminished executive power has been ushered in. This ruling will certainly have far-reaching consequences for both President Truman and all future presidents. Thank you, and good night.